Oh, I'm excited. It's like Christmas and I can't wait. Hi, I'm Joe and welcome to Motor City Boatworks. Let's get to work. If you're new to the channel, I want to welcome you. And if you're one of our returning subscribers, welcome back to my shop. I especially want to take a moment to thank the workers, those of you who are supporting the channel through Patreon. You're the ones who've made this channel possible. Thank you so much. This episode, I thought I would take a moment and begin to talk about some of the components that I'm going to be putting into the pocket trawler behind me. It's a 1986 Alban 27 family cruiser. It weighs about six, 7,000 pounds once it's all put back together. It's a fiberglass hull. It has an internal diesel engine, two cabins, a head, and a galley. I'm restoring it from a bare hull, and I've got to start sourcing and buying all of the big parts, the component items that I'm going to be putting back into it. I've got to rig up the systems, the electrical, the water, new navigational systems, and of course, install and repowered engine. This episode, I'm going to talk about sourcing the components that go into your pocket trawler restoration. This episode has a lot of details and a little bit of theory, so I hope you stick with me. I just want to take a moment to remind everyone that the inside of the Alvin 27 right now is a bare hull. I've stripped everything down. There are no systems on board. There's no wiring, no plumbing, no nothing. So I'm starting from a clean slate, basically a blank sheet of paper. Of course, this boat is almost 40 years old. So most of the original systems, well, they were outdated anyway. There's newer, better technology that's out there today. And I'm going to try and take advantage of that this is kind of a daunting task because to be honest with you, I've never done a restoration on this scale before where I have to kind of rebuild everything from scratch. All of the systems, how to lay everything out. Well, I've never really done this sort of thing before. I've taken some professional classes on diesel maintenance. I've taken several classes on marine electronics, how you build a system, how you wire everything together. But I have to tell you, I'm not a professional. So as we go forward, I'll be feeling my way along probably just like you would if you were working on your big boat project. If you have a comment or some feedback you'd like to provide about how you think this boat should be put back together, be sure to drop me an email or leave a comment below. I think the first thing to do is to break the components down into categories. That way we can kind of get an overview of what all the different parts are of this boat. Let's identify the components as the plumbing system, the electrical system, the navigational system. There'll be a category for propulsion system, and I'll have a final category called the interior components. Let's go through some examples of what each of these are. In the plumbing system, well, that's going to include all of the hoses, everything for the fresh water, the wastewater. It's going to include the toilet. It's going to include the water tanks, the waste tanks, all the pumps that make the systems work, a hot water heater, filters, the faucets, the shower heads, all this sort of stuff. The electrical system is everything that's related to making and storing electricity on the boat. The batteries, all the wiring, all the battery monitors, inverter, a battery charger, solar panel and controlling items, and two big ticket items, 12 volt refrigerator and a 12 volt air conditioning and heating system. Now, navigational components, they're electrical also, but we want to break those out because there's so many of them, they kind of are special in their own right. Things like a radar, depth sounder, knot meters, any sort of GPS or chart plotter equipment, radio, all this type of stuff, we'll categorize that as navigational system. The propulsion system, of course, is going to be the new diesel engine, but it will also include a stern thruster. The interior components includes things like the captain's helm chair, cushions, carpets, any sort of add-on storage lockers, teak wall decorations, this sort of stuff. Before I start picking the components for my pocket trawler, I think it's worth taking a moment to remember some of my design parameters. It's kind of like having a budget for your mind. Boat restoration rule 16. Use design parameters to 
help make decisions. This is gonna be the guideposts that kind of help me stay on the path as I begin to pick all the pieces that'll go back in the boat. Right off the bat, my number one design parameter is gonna be practicality. I want to base my choices on my years of having lived aboard a boat and having cruised on a boat before. I've gotta trust my judgment, I gotta trust my experience. The second design parameter is obviously money. I've been working on this boat for a number of years now, and I've tried to kind of choose the middle road insofar as budgeting. I don't choose the most expensive items, and I don't choose the cheapest items. Because I have a substantial budget for phase two, I've decided that I'm going to choose the items that I need to choose in order to meet my criteria for the boat. It's going to cost what it's going to cost, but if I can save a few bucks, well, I'm definitely going to try. My third design parameter as much as possible, I want to try and keep the systems simple. I think it makes sense to try and have simple systems, things that are not overly complicated, that are fairly easy to operate, that they're not going to cause some sort of long-term technological headache down the road. My final design parameter is maintenance and repairability. I've got to be able to work on the systems and components. I've got to be able to replace them as need be. So from a practical point of view, once you've got your design parameters, how do you figure out what are the actual items you're going to put in your boat? Well, I've been looking through marine catalogs and reading articles online. What are the mainstay components that people are choosing, that boat builders are choosing when they're building their small trawlers and it's given me some ideas we're going to go through some of them now motor city boatworks has no sponsors i get no compensation from any of the products or the items that i talk about on my channel please subscribe and tell a friend spread the word about motor city boatworks so let's talk about plumbing. Boat's going to have a freshwater system. It'll have a freshwater tank that gets filled up. I'm going to have an electric macerating toilet that goes to a waste tank. If we're lucky, that tank will also be somewhere around 30 to 50 gallons. In a separate episode, I talked about my decision to choose an electric toilet versus, say, a composting toilet. It's something you're going to want to check out. To maximize the fresh water on this boat, plan on choosing a 10-gallon water heater. There's a lot of different brands out there, but I have some criteria. This will be a marine water heater that's heated from 120 volt, but it can also be plugged in and run off of an inverter. In addition, I'd like this water heater to be able to be plumbed into the engine so that the engine can heat the hot water using a heat exchanger. The electrical components on this boat probably make up one of the most important systems. My pocket trawler is going to have a 12 volt DC electrical system, but it's also going to have 120 volt AC electrical system for when the boat is at a marina and it can be plugged into shore power. The 12 volt system is obviously run off batteries, and I'm guessing that I'm going to have at least a 500 amp hour lithium battery bank. That's going to be the house bank batteries, but I have to have a Additional dedicated batteries in order to be able to start the engine and also to run the stern thruster. I'm still in the research phase for the batteries, so I don't exactly know which brand or what the exact specifications are. All this will be covered in another episode. The batteries will be charged by three different methods. The first is they can be charged from an alternator that's attached to the engine, just like you would have in a car, except in this case, the alternator is a high output alternator specifically designed designed to charge the battery system very, very fast. Whenever the boat is underway, whenever we're under power traveling from point A to point B, well, the engine will be charging the batteries. The second means to charge the batteries is going to come from solar power. Because I built the extra large hardtop that covers almost the entire cockpit area of the boat, I'm able to have a very large solar array, probably at least a 500 watt solar panel setup. They'll go all across the top of the boat. It'll be passive, don't have to do anything, there just has to be some sun. 
The third way to charge the batteries is by using a dedicated battery charger, but in this case, the battery charger operates off of 120 volt AC, so it can only be used when the boat is plugged into shore power. So when you're at a marina, you're charging your batteries. There will be 12 volt USB outlets throughout the boat to be able to charge cell phones and small electronic items. There will be 120 volt outlets at least one in the aft cabin, one near the galley, one in the head area, and probably one in the engine compartment. One of the most important parts of the electrical system is going to be the point where shore power actually connects to the boat and gives you 120 volt AC. We're going to talk about the plug that I'm going to choose to do that. This is a piece of new technology, and I think it's going to be something that you're going to want to hear about. It's called the smart plug, and I'm going to talk about it in another episode. We'll go all into how how I installed it, why I chose this particular piece of equipment. An inverter will allow us to use the 120 volt outlets when we're underway. The inverter converts the 12 volt DC to 120 volt AC. Most of these electrical components, the battery charger, the inverter, the solar charger controller, all these items will come from a company called Victron. I've talked about them before and I consider them the gold standard for marine electrical components. There will be a battery monitor that kind of monitors everything and tells me the state of the batteries at any given moment. Now we'll talk about it later, but lights inside the boat, they're all going to be LED. All the lights throughout the boat running, interior or otherwise, they're all LED because they don't use a lot of electricity. The wiring throughout the boat will all be marine grade wiring. And we'll talk about how I'm going to choose and install that down the road. The electrical panels themselves and probably the monitors will be Blue Seas components. I like this brand. I find it to be very reliable and cost effective. This very large battery bank and the redundant charging system is what's going to allow this boat to have a refrigerator that runs entirely off of 12 volt DC. In addition, there'll be an air conditioning and a heating unit it and that will also run entirely off of 12 volt DC. Now the exact sizes of the battery banks and the solar panels, oh. well that will all depend on the very specifications for these big ticket items that I'm going to be putting in the boat. So we'll wait and see what exactly happens down the road, but for now it gives you an idea of what I'm thinking. Now let's talk about some of the navigation components. Truth be told, I haven't exactly figured out what sort of instruments and navigational items that I'm going to be putting into the boat. I'm still on the fence trying to decide what it is I might like. If you remember my episode where I was cruising in the Netherlands, I really started thinking about trying to keep things much simpler and not having all the electronic bells and whistles. But at the same time, now is the opportunity to really have some standout features on this boat. So at a minimum, I'm considering having a radar for the boat. And the question is whether or not this will be integrated into some sort of a chart plotter. The real question is what sort of chart plotter do I have? Do I have a standalone unit that goes inside the boat or do I choose something more like an iPad or a tablet that is really just a readout display? One of the items that I know I definitely want on the boat is some form of autopilot. This is an electronic device that you use to kind of hold a heading so you don't always have to be standing at the helm. My Alban 27 came with an autopilot. It's called a Raymarine Sport Pilot Plus. These units were made during the 80s and 90s, maybe the early 2000s. They were discontinued. They're no longer manufactured and you can't really get parts for them. However, they're great little units. They're perfect for boats under 30 feet, especially ones using cable steering. They're very unobtrusive. They sit behind the helm wheel. They don't take up a lot of space. They use an electronic flux gate compass and a rudder control indicator. Now, because these aren't made anymore, I've gone ahead and purchased a second used one for parts or as a spare. I'll be talking about this in another episode. My boat also came with 
what's called a, a Garmin 498 sounder. It's a combination depth sounder and fish finder. has a color display. It, it also has some limited chart plotter functions. This unit is still good today. In fact, it matches the new transducer that's inside the hull. I think I'm going to keep this unit for redundancy because I like having a dedicated depth sounder. One of the things I'm going to have is a boat horn. I've got this really cool vintage set of Hadley boat horns. You may have seen my video about this. They run off of a small 12 volt compressor. I'm going to have that installed so I can press a button and you'll get the boat horn. <laughs> On a powerboat, the most important system has to be the propulsion system. If you remember, I pulled the old diesel engine out of the Alban 27. It was a Nissan LD28. Parts aren't available for those anymore. It really didn't make sense to keep it in the boat, so I've opted for an entire new repower, and I've decided to go with, with a Beta Marine diesel engine. These are marinized Kubota engines. They're very reliable, they're mechanical, they have all the modern certifications, and I think it's just a great solution for repowering the boat. The only question is, what size engine do I go with? And I've narrowed it down to the Beta 38, the 43, or the Beta 50. We'll talk about all of these details down the road. There'll be many episodes where I talk about the repowering of the engine, so I hope you stick with me. Having a stern thruster is one of those luxury items that my experience cruising tells me it's something I want to have. It'll be mounted under the swim platform through the transom. What makes the stern thruster work on a boat like this is the addition of a fiberglass cowling. It directs the thrust that comes out of the thruster and makes it more efficient. Interior components are something that I haven't really given much thought to with the exception of the captain's helm chair. The original helm chair for this boat was a Todd pedestal mounted plastic chair. And I wanted to kind of upgrade that and go with something a little bit more fancy. Something better than it came from the factory. I've chosen a reclining captain's chair with adjustable arms. It'll recline all the way to 180 degrees flat. It'll be on a swivel pedestal with a back and forth slider. I'm going to cover the sizing and installation of this chair in a separate episode. Be sure to check it out. Whew. After all that, I don't know who's more exhausted, me or my checkbook. You would think that it's a simple matter of going out and buying all the things that you've already selected to put inside your pocket trawler, but I'm here to tell you that this was just the first step in a series of challenges to get the parts that I need to put back into my boat. I can tell you that I started trying to source the components maybe two, three months ago, and I'm just now, I've got about 50% of the items actually into the boat works. Forget about the money. The whole process has turned out to be very challenging. Things get lost in the mail. Orders never get fulfilled. Items are on back order. And sometimes companies, well, they're just making stuff up. In fact, this whole process, buying and selecting the parts, getting them shipped into the boatworks, it's turned out to be such a challenge that I've decided to make some detailed notes. I want to go ahead and keep track of each and every item and kind of the process of how I got each of the components. I'm going to create some detailed notes and I'm going to try and do some small videos unpacking some of the items talking about how and why they were selected. Now I'm gonna make all this content available to the workers. All you have to do is go over to Patreon, sign up. It doesn't matter whether you donate to the channel, you can sign up as a free worker, and then you can make the decision about whether or not you wanna get down into the details about the component buying process. Trust me when I say I've got a lot of great content coming up as we go forward in my pocket trawler build. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. We'll see you again next time. Stay motivated. If you like these videos, please hit the subscribe button. These videos would not be possible without your support.